so yeah, thank you for, for the introduction. Nice to be here. I actually was supposed to be in Berlin this week for a couple of different conferences, but well, plans change, as you know. Um, I will probably not be able to see the chat very good. So if you can monitor that, Bianca, that would be great. Yeah, we'll do. Uh, perfect. If there's an emergency question, just interrupt me. <laughs> Okay, cool. Yeah, the talk today is about not having a plan, basically. We will talk about remote work, about the combination of working remotely and traveling around the world, because that's basically what I did over the last two years. I'm back in Germany. Thank you, Corona, for that. I do miss travel a lot. <laughs> I, hope, I hope I can continue in a bit. And this will basically be a combination of my personal story, what I figured out along the way, and a little bit of how we work remotely at Platform SH. Platform SH is a company that is, um, we offer a second generation platform as a service. So we are uh, hosting your applications and websites in the cloud. We abstract infrastructure for you. So developers can focus on developing things and not take care about infrastructure. That's basically what we do. This talk will not go into the details of our product, just a little bit on our organization. If you want to know more about that, feel free to ask that in the chat there. I think are a couple of people around from Platform SH, they can answer that directly or I will do in the end. Um, so yeah, let's let's get this started. Um, all right, so first, a bit, first things first, a little bit about me, why am I even here, what am I doing? So as I mentioned, I work at Platform SH. I'm a solutions architect. That means I'm basically responsible for making customers happy and successful in the cloud using our product, giving them best practices and making sure they get the right product. I am from Germany, so if there's an accent here and there, sorry for that, but we have many Germans around, so that should be fine. Um, I used to travel over the last two years and let's begin with the traveling part of the story. So for that we need to go back actually into 2015. 2015 I was 27 years old, you can do the math and figure out how old I am today. Um, I had seven years of experience, uh, that means I already worked a lot in a couple of different companies, um, I had a 75 kilometer uh, drive one way to the office. Uh, luckily, I had a company car, but still, that was a lot of traveling back and forth every day. But I was already used to working kind of remotely. And this is something when we talk about remote work that I figure many companies underestimate because many of you are already doing remote work. Uh, even in non-corona pandemic times. Um, so if you travel to, to customers and have them on site, if you go on site for meetings, or even if you video call from your office to the client's office, that is something that is called remote work, if you want. So I was pretty much used to working wherever I am, Anyways, I worked from hotel rooms with clients. I worked at clients' offices. I worked uh, from home from time to time. I worked with people who came to the office only once a week. So the construct and the idea of working remotely was not really something that's new to me. But we were all located in Germany. So everyone was German or most of the people were German. We were working uh, many times in the office, but also in the same time zone. So what's changed? 2015, I spent two months in New York. Why not, right? Um, let me tell you how that came together. So it basically started on an evening like this, sitting in the sun with a friend over a beer, because, well, we're German. Um, so we had this idea of why he was freelancing and I was working at a company who allowed kind of remote work and were flexible with that. So we had this stupid idea after a couple of years, why not spend a couple of weeks or even two months in New York? Um, in the end, I did, he didn't. <laughs> but when he dropped out, I still figured this is a good chance to, to do that. So I went to my boss and just asked him. I basically asked, well, would you be okay with me working from another time zone, working from New York for two months? And luckily he was. So I, Got a flight to New York, spent two months there. It was winter, it was December and January at the time. 
Um, but this was basically my first real life contact with working in a different time zone, working from another country. And it, I figured a couple of things. And this is basically where the story begins when I fell in love with the idea of working remotely and also traveling. So first of all, there was obviously a huge time difference. So the morning usually started very hectic because when I get up in New York, Germany was already awake for half a day. So that means there's a lot of communication back and forth in the mornings and right when you wake up. But then after lunch, basically, and I used to do that from, from the office, from the, my Airbnb, and then I go out for lunch and then I work from coffee shops or from a co-working space. So I basically had the whole afternoon working uninterrupted for myself. And one of the things that I figured quite, quite quickly is I am a lot more productive suddenly because there's no interruption. There's no meetings in afternoons because people are in their um, uh, evenings in, in Germany already. So I got a lot of time. I was way more productive. I was able to get more work done in less time. So I had more time to experience the city. So that was one of the concerts that felt very nice in the beginning. And yeah, this was basically the start of, yeah, the, the, the spark that made the flames of the idea of me going full-time remotely. So why did I decide to go fully remote and not um, go, go home after that? I did that a couple of years later, actually. Um, I did another two months in Bali and Australia, uh, a year after New York. But at some point I, I decided I don't want to do that only a couple of months a year. I, I want to do it full time. Why is that? Well, the simplest reason is because I can and also why not? So I had the possibility, I had chances and I figured I'm in a good position and a good spot in my time, the time in my life to just do it. It came together with the, the love of traveling that I had anyways and Sorry for all the Germans out there, but Germany sometimes feels very gray, very boring, especially in the winter time. And at the time, I didn't have too many responsibilities. No house to be paid, no wife, <laughs> no, no dog or something like that that I have to take care of. So it was easy to just try it out. And one of the things that I've seen before is it worked. It worked for me, it worked in New York, it even worked in Australia with an even higher time difference. It also worked for others that you see all those stories on the internet who, of people who are doing it. And I also had um, a friend who was already doing it for, for two or three years at the time. So I knew that it can work. I didn't know if it would work for myself, but the nice thing is, I was also in a good position to just see if it works. Because if it don't, won't work, and this is what I thought at the time, if it won't work, I can always just come back, right? There's, I, I work in the IT industry, there will always be jobs somewhere to find. Um, and Germany is not the worst place to come back to, so there's a good you know, social security net, even if I need to, to make use of that. So I decided to just start the journey. And this was basically, well, there's a little bit more plan, planning as you can think, but there were not too many details because from, and this is the part where, where it comes to not having a plan for me is I wanted to test it out and I wanted to make myself comfortable testing it out. So I didn't make made too many assumptions. I didn't set too many goals. So on the one hand, I didn't um, gave myself like a deadline. I didn't say I will be back in Germany in, in five years or in two years. But I also didn't set a deadline in the other way around. I didn't say to myself, I need to be away for the next two years. For me, it was always clear, like, if it won't work, I can, in, if I figure it out after two weeks, I will just come back. Um, and if it works for two years, I will be away for two years or even all my life. I, I didn't know that at the time. And I think that was a very good starting point for myself because that opened, I had me had my mind open to just see what comes along, basically. So I booked a one-way ticket to Cape Town. And I'm not showing this slide because this is just a beautiful sunset. Mm. It's also because Cape Town was a nice starting point and that happened basically by accident because it got a very cheap flight there. Um, but Cape Town was nice uh, for a couple of reasons. One, it is, 
at the time I went freelancing and many of my clients luckily didn't care where I was working um, as long as the results are there and they always were there so they were fine but it was good to have a huge overlap time zone wise so as you know Cape Town in, in South Africa has a lot of overlap with Germany I think it's just an hour different uh, maybe two hours um, in, in uh, winter times but still I had a lot of overlap and it was easy to not work uh, early in the morning or late at night so that was good Cape Town as a city is also nice because it doesn't feel completely different for everybody who has been there of course it's a different country but it is still it feels very western like so it's not like a completely different city not not south africa or southeast asia or even deeper in africa where you have like a huge cultural difference so it was kind of nice as a start um the vibe where, there was very nice uh, you have everything you need internet connections were good enough so that worked out very nicely actually and from there um because i get that question a lot i pick countries where i go to more or less randomly because most of the time i just open google maps and see what's around and then i do a little bit of research on the countries so from cape town i actually worked my way up to over namibia kenya and then morocco to see a little bit of africa because why not so that that was basically the starting point and then this is me in 2020. Um, some of those numbers are a little bit scary. Um, as someone is concerned about our climate change, the kilometers I've spent on airplanes is actually not something I'm very proud of. Um, but on the other hand, the cultural exchange and, and you know seeing different countries and other places has been worth to me so far. But yeah, I spend a lot of time in airplanes. I spend a lot of hours in airplanes. Um, the 46 countries is not something that I visited over the last two years. It's probably more like around 30, maybe a little bit less. Um, but I've been to 46 countries in my life, which is great, a great experience to have um, seeing so many different peoples. Um, and this is actually something that's, that's also important to me is I, when I go to, when I visit countries, when I go to new cities, I try to not stay in the touristic bubbles of those cities. I usually stay in Airbnbs because I don't want to you know, stay in hotels all the time. Mo many times it's also cheaper and it also allows me to experience the day-to-day -day life that people in those cities have. Um, and also allows me to cook meals for myself and don't have to go out every time. So the drive to my office is now zero kilometers, which is great because spending time in German traffic is also not the greatest experience. This is still a work in progress. Um, I had a couple of different plans, of course. Um, so we will see how that goes after uh, the COVID situation is, is being released. But for the time being, I'm, I'm also fine here in Germany, to be honest, that's all right. Jumping into the working part of the story. And this is where the company platform.sh comes in a little bit, because while I was freelancing for the first year, um, the dynamic is a little bit different when you work for a team or when you work as in a company that is completely distributed. So the reason for me to switch from freelancing to working in a company again was mainly because I missed working in a team. Um, freelancing worked out fine. I was interacting with customers, but I was doing the, the work more or less um, on my own at, at many points. So Platform SH allowed me to do a little bit of interaction with different teams and, and work in the company again. We are completely distributed. I think we have like around 190 people now. We work in 14 different time zones um, all over the world. How did, how did that go? The onboarding story is actually something that is um, interesting because I started my interview, interviewing process in Spain. I signed the contact when I was in Germany for a quick visit. My first week was actually in Thailand when most of my team was in Paris and in the US. Um, and for my second week, I, I spent one week in, in France with a couple of teammates and my actual boss at the time, like in person, and that was a good start to have. But uh, yeah, it, it, right from the beginning, it basically showed that working from different countries just has to work, even in, in that context. 
Um, also, what's interesting is some people I worked with on a day-to-day -day basis, I met just after 10 months where we had our first all company summit. So people you interact with, um, you just interact with virtually. Um, and it feels weird because for the, the reasons of the current pandemic, it feels so normal for us. But for, for many people switching from um, non-remote work or aesthetic work in, in offices, switching to remote work, this is a huge change, right? You, you interact with people, even if it's with camera, it's still digital. Um, one thing that we do at Platform SH that I figure is important to mention because it actually makes sense and it was a lot of help is we assign buddies from different teams or even from the same team you are in. So you have someone who you can interact, you have a fixed meeting for the first couple of weeks every day. So you have one touch point with someone um, every day. And in the beginning, that helped me a lot to figure things out, having a platform to ask questions when I have them about the things that we are doing how I got started. So this is, this is again, everything about that is my personal kind of story or my personal opinion. There's nothing that is, I don't want to convince you to do anything the same way that I'm doing it. I'm just telling what worked for me. So, and I, fi I figure it makes sense to talk a little bit of how your mindset can be when you start a remote job or when you start remote working with such a distributed company. First things first, I actually, I, I overwhelmed myself in the beginning sometimes because it's a new company, new people, there are so many things and I wanted to, you know, get everything. Um, I read so many of our documentation, I interacted with so many people and I did as much as possible to, to just get infused with as many things that I can learn. I ask questions a lot. Um, I think at the time I really had this strong opinion that people are annoyed by me asking questions. They never said that, but maybe sometimes it was a lot. Um, I think what's important in general is I didn't wait for work to be assigned to me. Um, I just jumped in anything I could find to work on, especially in the beginning where you don't have like the clear task for everything in detail yet it makes sense to try out different things and just see and find things very quickly where it can actually have an impact and can help. And I think for, for me, the general rule is if you are, if you have the feeling that you're over communicating, that, that's probably about right. Because working remotely means you have to do a lot of communication and there's um, a lot that can happen between the lines. There's a lot that can happen um, with non-communicating about the things you are doing, also about the things you are not doing. So when in question, just try to communicate as much as possible in whatever platform you feel comfortable with. Speaking about communication. So asynchronous communication, because I talk to people who are sleeping um, basically and wait for a response the next day, who are in different time zones, it can be hard. So there's no way of fighting it you have to find a way to embrace it. You have to find a structure and you have to find ways of communication that work with that principle. English is obviously super important. Even more important probably is written English. Um, while many people don't have English in, in, as their first language, it is still something that you, I think, need to be capable of, especially in those international distributed um, teams because there's a lot that can go wrong if you can't express yourself and express the problems you're having. Also, the um, combination of writing and talking and chatting is, is a complicated thing, I think, because some people want to write, some people want to actually jump on a call. Um, bringing those together is not always very easy. And in the end, the written English part is the one that can only brings everything together, especially if, it, uh, and this is another point, especially if it comes to documentation. When we are talking, and Platform SH is, is still uh, a startup that is fastly growing, there is a lot of things that are not there yet. There's not, everything is not documented. Um, you, you won't find every problem and every solution written yet. So you need to have a lot of a uh, on hand, hands-on mentality, basically to you know, just start figuring things out, asking questions. 
And that's also a good thing if you are on the way of, of figuring things out. Um, if there's something that's not documented, start documenting it on the way because the next person who jumps on the ship may find it easier if you do that. And then I think what is also underrated is the topic of remote management. Um, and for me, one thing is the, the core principle of all management, not only remote, is management is about trust, right? You hire people, you give them money to do a specific job, and if you don't trust them, why do you even care of doing that? Um, and it, it, this is something that is not specific for me to, you know, in a remote working environment, it's true for, for all management. But in remote contexts, there's just no other way around that. You have to trust someone. So my boss right now sits in San Francisco. So if he wouldn't trust me, he, he can't control me because it's just out of his time zone, right? Um, and part of it as a manager, and I know this is sometimes hard because I also manage a team of four or five people a couple of years ago, and letting go is hard. Um, but you have to do that as a manager because otherwise it just, it's not something that works, not something that scales for you and you just get overwhelmed as a manager and also as an employee. So even if people are doing things a little bit different than you would do it, that doesn't mean that they can't have a successful outcome. This means there's obviously no way of micromanaging things. So what we do at Platform SH is basically we have more or less guidelines of where people can move within, but not specific how to do this and that task for, for many jobs. Um, a lot of it is also about transparency. So it only makes sense to give people all the information they need so you can be sure they make good decisions. So everything that can be documented should be documented. Um, you also have to make sure that people can follow what you are doing, what other teams are doing. So as much as you can do things in the open. And Feedback is obviously something that is also very important because people can feel lost very quickly. Um, and for me, what I figured is that some people need different platforms to give you that feedback. Some people might want to give it in writing. Some might feel more comfortable in a one-on-one -on -one meeting. Some may even only can do that in a in-person meeting once a year. So you have to figure out how to make giving feedback very easy. And those regular one-on-ones and, and even in-person meetings are also important. So what we do, um, we have usually, if it, traveling is allowed, <laughs> usually we have two meetings every year. One is the all company meetup where everyone, all the 190 people meet somewhere. And the other are different team meetings um, specific to, to your team. So you at least see your teammates twice a year and, and everybody from the company you should see at least once a year. And of course, then there's other jobs who involve more traveling. So when I go to events, I also see people from different teams on my own team a little bit more, but at least one or two times a year, you should be able to see um, people like in person because if, Everything works in, in in way of day to day business, but nothing leaves out uh, the the chances that you have with an in person meeting with the chat over a beer with the chat over a coffee. Uh, so this is those meetings are not mainly about uh, performance outcomes, but for uh, like the interaction with other teams. And I think this is something that is very important. Um, I want to tell you a little bit of a story where I think time zones can be really awesome and not hard. Um, so let's say there is a new task. So me and my colleague, this is a case that actually happened like two weeks ago or something. So let's say there's a new task for me and a colleague. And the colleague is in Canada and I'm currently in Germany. So we don't have a lot of overlap. We get assigned a new task from our boss, which is in a different time zone than me. Um, I am seeing that task on day one in my late evening. So I decided to just have a quick chat with my colleague Yuri um, to see how we should tackle that. That means when I go to sleep, Yuri can already start working on it. So he did that and the next day 
I wake up with the first couple of questions and unresolved issues with the whole technical setup that he, he had. So basically he made a description of, this is what I did, this is where I struggle with, do you have any ideas? Uh, let's continue this the next day. So I can use my time that, that I have when he's asleep to actually work on that and give him my response and figure out the, the solution. So he can pick it up when he gets up. Um, and then on day three, uh, he basically had everything he needed to do. He could run whatever needs to be run and I can see the results. So I start working on those results and transcribing them into a document that is a little bit more, you know, customer friendly. And while doing that, I had a couple of ideas of how we can improve that. So before I start, uh, before I finish my day, um, we also do a quick discussion of how to do that. And then the next day, basically everything is finished. Before I have my first copy or after I have my first copy, I can see the changes, um, update the documentation and see the final results. So what I'm, what I'm saying here is, and this is the same thing over and over again, is over a couple of days, you can basically, if you do it right, you can work 24 hours a day without you working 24 hours a day. So you can use time zones to your advantage. This doesn't work all the time, obviously, and there need to be a couple of things to be right to be able to do that. One is there has to be planning and agreement. So on the task that is, that is there. Um, and that means the task that you are tackling needs to be well-defined and scoped. There can't be much confusion about what is the thing we are actually working on. And what I figured is, over the years, also not in this case, but also with different clients, is that the remote contact sometimes enforces you to do that. So you have no other choice but to do that. So let me tell you a, little, a small different story is, I had this one client back in the day, and he, they had the, when there is something that came to their minds, they just picked up the phone and called me. That was always very rough ideas, not a clear scope, not a clear task to have, and you have to figure that out on the spot. By working from a different time zone, I forced them to think more about what they actually wanted from me. So they needed to write it down in an email. And while doing that, they figured, well, this could be not clear enough or something like that. And even by just giving them a couple more hours to think about it, it made the task more defined and more uh, scoped for me so I could pick it up more easy. So this is also something you shouldn't um, work against, but try to enforce it and try to work in, in your favor. Of course, there should be clear communication. So on those touch points with my colleague and me every evening, um, there was a clear communication of what he is doing, what he's not doing, what I'm doing, what I'm not doing. So I think sometimes communicating what you're not doing is quite also important than the thing you, you are actually working on because let's say the typical case that there is something like we should work on this and that and you have four people and everybody else thinks somebody else is working on it so in the end nobody does it so if you are able to tell that this is the part i'm not doing um it makes it easier for everybody to communicate on the thing you're doing um and of course in some points this the, some cases this means you have to be a little bit more flexible in your schedule. I'm not saying you should work every night and I definitely don't want to do that. Um, but especially when the time zones are uh, hugely different, you should make some room here and there um, just to accommodate both. Maybe that means I have to stay up a little bit longer and maybe that means my colleague has to get up a little bit earlier just for this one project or for this one task. That shouldn't be the rule, definitely not. So and, and let me tell you that this, this is a great feeling. If you do that, if you can work constantly and you see progress every day, that's a great feeling. It doesn't always work. When it does, it's just awesome. Tools. Mm. I don't want to spend too much time on that and I don't have the list of specific tools you need to have in a remote context. The one important information is there is a tool for everything and just adding some tool and just using Slack is not, does not make you a remote company and that does not make you like a good company. Um, 
before using or choosing or focusing on a tool or even implementing something for your own, think about, let's get some one step back. Focus on what you want to accomplish. What's the problem you actually want to solve? Is it about communication? What kinds of communication is it? Is it real time? Is it something like asynchronous? Um, and then you will always find a tool because there are just so many tools around. There will always be a tool for what you want to do. But you know, if you want to put a nail in the wall, you need a hammer and not something else, not a shoe. So think about what you want to do before you actually choose just random tools and tools won't solve any problems using the tools will. Um, and therefore for, in my opinion, try to find a tool that's easy to use and also easy to access because people don't want to spend a lot of time explaining things. You don't want to, to figure out a tool that is complicated by yourself. Um, something that has been proven, and Slack is a good example of that. Google Docs is a good example of that. Things that just work are mostly fine, even if they sometimes not fit your purpose like 100%. Um, so that translates to a day in my life. Um, this is a, a kind of typical day that I made up. Um, how it could look like when I'm, especially when I'm traveling. So I usually wake up between eight and nine, depends. Uh, one of the greatest luxuries in my life is usually I don't have to wake up by an alarm and this is great. Um, I wake up, I have the bad habit of checking my emails and Slack messages in bed. I shouldn't do that, but well, I do. I then have coffee and I have breakfast and shower. Then maybe I have a client meeting and a demo or something like that in the morning. So I do that. In the meantime, I work on, on specific projects or I prepare the meetings. Then uh, during lunchtime, I usually would go out to explore a little bit wherever I am, um, search for a good coffee, search for a spot to work from. Um, this is actually a good, good point because for me, changing, so starting in an Airbnb in the morning or starting at a desk in my Airbnb in the morning and then changing places, allows my brain to switch places also and gives me a little more flexibility. It just gives you a different mindset by just changing the location with at the same time e either changing the task or by just giving you a moment to step back from your current task and think about it in a different context. So that for me, that works a lot of time. Then I usually have maybe some focus time um, where I work specifically on this one project um, or make, make some room for whatever is um, currently on, on my list. Maybe in the, in the afternoon, then there's a team catch up with uh, uh, my team, which is mainly in the US, uh, mainly in, in Europe, sorry. Um, then there could be another client meeting later in the, in the afternoon. Maybe in the evening, there's even a call in the, with uh, US teams. And then when, you know, I have free time. I just do what you all do. I, I watch Netflix. I go out for a drink. I catch dinner. I cook dinner for myself. What I'm trying to say here is even if I'm traveling all the time, my schedule doesn't look so different than yours. Um, it's not like I'm a, on a constant holiday working from the pool. Uh, I still have to get things done and have to figure out how a way how to structure my day. Um, and let's let's have a look on, on a couple of things in this schedule also. So first of all, I always try to leave some room and flexibility. So don't schedule, I don't schedule my whole day on for the last hour, for the last minute. I usually try to leave some room for, um, to, to be more flexible, especially for me, since I'm working in a client facing role, there's always something that comes in, but it also allows me to, um, maybe schedule the, the break a little bit earlier or a little bit later so I don't have to be so strict with everything. The local exploration and changing scenario part is, is something I already talked about. Um, for, for me, it's, it's a very nice thing to, to do. And if you take nothing from this talk, just remember that your Slack and your email application do have a function to quit. So if you want to focus on something and work for a couple of hours on something that needs your attention and only your attention at the time, just quit everything that can disturb you. Um, usually that, that shouldn't be um, an issue. And most of the people in this call, or at least I don't do anything that is so urgent 
um, that I don't can that I can't step back for for a couple of hours to finish what I'm working on. So if you don't want to get distracted, just quit those applications that do distract you, or stay away from Facebook. And of course, there's a lot of coffee involved. No, no way to do anything without coffee. Okay, coming to the last part um, of the story is how to figure things out. Um, so again, those are my learnings and something I figured out over the years doing that kind of lifestyle. That doesn't mean that yours have to be the same. Um, for me, an open mind is key um, for my surroundings, for myself, and also to figure out how to live with myself. Um, that sounds very dramatic. It's not that dramatic. For me, I was traveling alone like 90% of the time. So I have to find a way to be comfortable with myself. Um, and so this was definitely good for my, my own mind in terms of being happy with myself and being um, confident with me. There is no rush. Um, for example, in the beginning, um, with trying that out, I switched places every couple of weeks, every two weeks, I would be in a different country. Um, that is very hectic and very stressful. So I figured there's nobody is telling me how fast I need to go. So I can figure out my own speed. Uh, this is the German talking me, but efficiency works for me, works better than overtime. So if I can take a little bit time, spend on planning and doing things correct the first time, that's for me, it's just easier than working a lot. Um, I already said that it's okay to have the occasional early meeting and late night call. They happen. It's okay, especially in that remote context. Um, I don't want to fight it but I also don't want to make it the, the rule. I don't want to, and I did that. I, in Australia, which was very hard, I did that for a couple of days working every night instead of the day. And that just does work. At least for my biorhythm, that don't work. Um, and in the end, learning all those things about how I behave, how I can do work best um, and what setup I need, it enables me to deliver, deliver great work. Clients were always happy. My bosses were, or bosses were always happy. Um, the colleagues I worked with usually work with me, um, but want to work with me. So I need to find a way of yeah, being open to learn all that and then enable that for myself to, to actually be able to deliver good work. So what's the great stuff? Obviously, I'm a fan uh, of remote work and, and also the combination of remote work and traveling. What is great about it? Well, you can basically make your own rules. How you structure your day is most of the time up to you. Of course, there's influence from client meetings and things that are more or less fixed, but around that, you can basically organize yourself. Um, this is not specific to remote and traveling. This is specific to remote. So if you work, even if you work from home, and many of you are experienced that, if you want to go for a longer lunch break in, in during midday, if you want to go to the gym um, for for one hour or so, or if you want to take need to take care of uh, your kids uh, for their homework, you can do that and you can schedule your work around that and it works. So that that's just, I found that that freedom is just so amazing. The combination of course with traveling is you can see a lot of new places, you meet new people, you see new cultures. Um, that's for me also something that it has always been very great to interact with local communities, go to local events, uh, work from co-working spaces from time to time, just to see how different people see things differently. Well, the sun is shining right now, but Sometimes it's not, especially in Germany. If you like the sun more than the rain, like me, that's something you can choose. And that's nice to have the beach around, or I always love to work around the water, even if it's a river, if it's a lake or something like that, that's just great. So I can choose the climate I want to be in. And working at Platform SH even made that very clear to me that working with teams from so many different backgrounds and different countries, different cultures, different mindsets is something that is just a privilege to have. Um, adding a couple of uh, answers from a survey that we recently did. So we are 
uh, around 190 people and I think almost half of them answered this survey. And one of the questions that is uh, not surprising to me, but, but very um, nice to see again is the question being fully remote, have you been able to achieve some of your personal goals has been answered by many people by they can work out again, they can take better rest, they can take better care of their children. Um, and what you see is that travel is only, that's probably just my answer. So um, traveling is not the most important part to people, but you know, structuring your day a little bit differently and, and doing things that are important to you is something that remote work allows you to do. And that's great to see. But of course, there's not only sunshine, sometimes it rains. So there's a few things that you should need to take care of. One is, I mentioned that you can organize yourself and that's the great freedom you have, but that also means you definitely have to organize yourself and you have to be reliable. And from my point of view, it has always been the case that I want, I never want to be questions, questioned on my lifestyle, never be questions on the things that I'm doing, combining travel and work, and never want to question um, if I am productive enough. So I put a lot of effort in making myself available, making myself reliable. And this is something you need to take care of because um, what people sometimes don't see, like in remote contexts, if someone doesn't produce a regular outcome, this is visible very quickly. So if there are no messages, if there is nothing happening, you don't get your stuff done, this will probably be visible faster than in an office setup. Just my, my opinion. Loneliness is something that you can't take too easy, um, especially when it comes to traveling. But I think also at home, this is something that is important to have in mind and too important to actively work against, both from your own side, but also from your employer's side probably, um, because it can happen a lot. It can happen very fast that you feel disconnected um, and that you actually feel uh, lonely. You always have to weigh planning versus flexibility. So traveling obviously is a lot, there's a lot of planning involved. You don't want to end up in like a bad spot without Wi-Fi um, or in a bad stop, stop spot in terms of a unsafe area of the city. So on the one hand there's planning, on the other hand you want to be flexible. So don't, in, in my case, I want to be able to choose countries as I, as I wish and this, this flexibility demands a little bit of planning. Um, what is important, and, and I'm very glad that a good friend of mine who worked remote before me for a couple of years uh, told me that before I started is, you have to stay in touch with your family and friends that you left at home. Because basically you left home if you do that kind of lifestyle. Um, you are not the one who, they are not the one who, who went away. So that's you. So their life goes on. And if you don't, have can you can't take it badly if they don't send you messages because you are basically decided to uh, i decided to move out of their day-to-day -day life where i was part of before so it's kind of my job to stay in touch and kind of my responsibility to put in a little bit more effort um to keep those relationships relationships alive and it's very easy to lose those relationships if you don't you know the occasional WhatsApp message of um, how are you, do, how, how's it going, how was your day, um, do you want to have a chat or, or a Skype call, is something that you have to initiate more than they. Um, and of course, especially in those settings where you work with people in different time zones, there is always work. If I want, I can open Slack, 24 hours a day and I will find someone who's working. I find something to do. There's always work, obviously. Um, so getting yourself into a kind of burnout situation is very easy. Um, so you have to be very careful with that and, and work against that. By working out, by doing other things, by actually closing your laptop when you go to bed or something like that. It's harder than it sounds. Um, and this is, I think that one of the last slides I have, and maybe one of the things that I like the most about not only traveling and working remotely, but working remotely in general is 
the, everything I just told you is just the way that I did it, the way that I experienced, the way that, that I tried to figure things out and the way that Platform SH works. That doesn't mean that your company needs to work the same way. It doesn't mean that there is only this one truth. The beauty is you can find your own version that just works for you and works best for you and embrace that. Um, sometimes there are more restrictions, sometimes there are none, but you can find your way around those and you can structure everything around that. So this is, this is something that for me, working remotely, this is the greatest thing about it. Um, all right, I think that's everything I had so far. It took a little bit longer than I actually thought. Um, no interruptions so far. Before we come to the q and A, I I quickly want to, to introduce you to a couple of other, sorry, a couple of other events we are doing this week. I have another talk that is more technical for the developers with the We Are Developers Live week that we have this week. This will be on Friday um, in your lunch break. So if you want to learn about front-end performance testing and practice, feel free to, to join me for lunch. It's a free event. And we also have the our Deploy Friday um, regular webinar. And this week it will be also on Friday, later in the afternoon, uh, about extending Platform SH. Different customers are have built different things. And I would encourage you to check out our webinar series as well. Most of them are technical, but sometimes it's also about remote tooling. There are also re recordings available um, of everything. So you will find probably something that is interesting to you 